Okay, welcome gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, the next in our series of, of tech breakfasts here at uh, Golden Square, Jigsaw 24. Um, we say this every time, but it's worth uh, repeating. Uh, a whole load of stuff goes on here. Generally speaking, in the mornings, early tech breakfasts are engineering fundamentals. And in the evenings and the afternoons, it's sort of product-related demos. So I think we've got a mix with the pros coming up next week, which will be sort of S6. And I don't know who our sort of big name uh, um, audio person is. We've had Giles Martin recently, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a headliner. Um, but a lot going on. There'll be a whole load of post-NAV stuff as well. Uh, so keep your eye on jigsaw24.com. And uh, although it's, it's registration, you know, kind of everybody's welcome. So today, uh, Tech Breakfast, Electrics for Film and TV, uh, Best Practice, plus the 18th edition. Um, uh, the 18th edition uh, comes into force in, in, uh, this summer, in June. And um, it's, the, it's the guiding, uh, it's not legislation, but it's the guiding set of rules that, that basically allow us to build and maintain safe electrical installations. Because electricity is the thing that's still left in our industry that kills people. Um, when I started in the 80s, Ever Telecine had a wet gate and so had you know, lots, lots of nasty uh, uh, toxic chemicals. You know, two inch VTRs had air compressors that, that, that you know, were dangerous. Uh, and we've got to the point now we have no more CRT, so we have no huge volts inside our equipment, but we still do have mains electricity, which, which potentially kills people. And so we're going to talk a little about specific requirements for production facilities, um, why we do th things the way we do. Um, hum, uh, you know, that's kind of a thing where there's lots of sort of uh, jungle knowledge surrounding it, lots of sort of received wisdom, and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of, of, of the best ways of building facilities to avoid hum and those kind of things. Um, a robust test regime, how you should be keeping records about, uh, about the, the sort of testing procedure that was used when your MCR was built or, or when a new edit suite was built, how you tested and certified the, the electrical uh, distribution in the room. I'll show you a little bit about remote control mains distribution data centres. The, the, the bulk of our workload now is building facilities where at least some element of the build is in a remote data centre. And of course, nobody wants to have to drive for half an hour just because a machine is blue screened. Uh, and, and so remote um, control and remote monitoring of, um, uh, of PDUs and, and the way you're using electricity in the data centre is very important. One of the compelling reasons why people move to data centres is because of the difference in, in the wholesale and the retail cost of electricity. Uh, and, and so that, that kind of further adds to that. Uh, I've already mentioned mains hum. We'll talk about that. Why, why uh, you suddenly find you've got uh, a piece of uh, audio equipment in one room that's got a 50 hertz hum on it and how, how you can best avoid those things. Um, and then we'll talk about the standards because, of course, the 18th edition is the main event. That's what we all have to know about come this summer. But we'll talk a little bit about what the 17th edition uh, brought to the parties. Ten years since the 17th edition came in, and it did bring some significant things um, to, to electrical uh, distribution and, 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 and sort of safety standards. So, as I say, safety first. Um, uh, and, and, and voltages over 50 volts AC are considered uh, hazardous. Uh, you know, you don't need very many, milli, uh, men, very many volts and very many milliamps uh, for something to be uh, dangerous, particularly to your heart. It's when, it's when electrical current passes across your chest cavity. That's the biggest risk to a person. And uh, if you've ever watched a, a Sparky working on a live distribution board, they'll quite often lift the foot opposite the hand they're working with because they know full well that a, a shock down one side of your body is a darn sight less risky than a shock across your chest cavity. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, despite all the um, uh, kind of potential uh, dangers, there are only about a thousand accidents involving electric shocks in Britain every year. Uh, it, was, it was tens of thousands as recently as the 70s. Uh, and so, you know, people who get kind of very fussy about health and safety gone mad, health and safety can go as mad as it likes if, it, if it's kind of reducing those kind of figures. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, oh, and of course, the, the, as, as well as shocks to people, um, uh, fires are the, uh, are the other big risk. Um, I read that the biggest cause of, of injury from electric shock on building sites was actually people falling off the stepladder they were on. You know, and so it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a shock injury rather than the actual electric shock that, 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 that hurt them. So there's two primary um, considerations for, for electrical safety. One is the safety earth and one is the fuse. Uh, the fuse will rupture. It's a sacrificial uh, uh, element. It will rupture if, if too much current is being pulled through a circuit and, and, and then render the um, uh, circuit safe. Uh, and, and that provides protection from fire because if, if something was drawing lots of current, getting very hot, um, uh, the fuse ruptures and, and, and it's been made safe. 
And the third pin on a, on a, on a 30, 13 amp mains plug, the, the, the earth pin, that's the other thing. And that provides uh, a very low impedance path to earth uh, for current if the chassis of a piece of equipment has become live, for example, through a fault or through some miswiring or something like that. And generally speaking, uh, the three-phase distribution that comes into larger than domestic facilities carries an earth. Uh, years gone by, the earth would have been uh, a sunk rod into the ground somewhere near the facility, somewhere near the premises. Uh, but nowadays, uh, electrical companies provide you with an earth, which is derived from the, the neutral centre tap point at the substation where, where the three phase is being distributed from. Um, and, and as I say, you know, water pipes, metal spikes sunk in the ground are no longer considered uh, uh, adequate as, as, as means of earthing. So, you know, again, we're all just kind of going over stuff we know already, but it's worth making these points. Uh, the kind of connectors we come across in, in, in production facilities. Uh, we've got the 10 amp IC C13 style connector. And there's a few of them here, which I'll wave around. Um, you know, you see it on the end of most of the, uh, the cables that we plug into things. Um, you know, there's the, there's the male version, which is an outlet. And uh, there's the female version, which is, of course, an inlet. You don't want to have volts on pins. Uh, that's kind of deadly. Although the BBC for a long time did have a, a mains XLR connector where you could get volts on pins. And if you had very stubby, uh, chubby fingers, you could get your, your finger down onto the, uh, onto the connector. Um, uh, 16 amp uh, commando style. Um, and generally speaking, when we're specking a machine room, uh, we would spec this as being the standard connector for the bay. So if you want to isolate the bay, there's a, a commando outlet above the bay and, and, and tugging this will isolate the bay. Uh, and, and so that's a, a well-established connector, the commando connector. And then there's the, the, other, the other sort of 16-stroke, um, 20-amp connector, depending on who you talk to, the, um, uh, the PowerCon connector, uh, which uh, typically is the inlet for uh, PDUs, um, very sort of commonly seen. And then there's the sort of the newer C19, C20 style connectors that you see on the back of UPSs and, and other things that require a bit more grunt. Um, G5 Max, if you remember those, they, they, had, they had those kind of connectors, which um, yeah, cause lots of uh, trouble because they're not so common. Um, but anything that requires more than 32 amps, generally speaking, won't have a deriggable plug that you can, you can deal with. Uh, you know, it's, that's a special piece. And, you know, in the last 20 years, how many pieces of broadcast equipment require more than an amp or two? Uh, that's quite uncommon. And, of course, fuses. Uh, uh, you, you know, that's the other primary um, uh, safety feature, the fuse. Uh, and it's a rupturable device, it's a sacrificial device, and, and they're the sort of things you see in, in 13 amp mains plugs. And uh, they're the kind of things you see in PDUs, uh, you know, typically a 3 amp or a 10 amp fuse, depending on the circuit. And uh, that, that, that's quite a good illustration, because that's, um, that's a fast blow fuse. You can see that the, 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 the fusible element is, 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 is held with a spring, so that if this thing is kind of running at just close to its capacity, and this is starting to get warm, starting to get warm, the, 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 the spring will pull it apart very quickly, so it'll rupture very quickly. Um, and you know, we, talk, we talk about ratings, voltage, and speed. Is it a, a T-rated fuse, an anti-surge fuse, or an F-rated fuse, a fast blow fuse? And again, it's, it's all about uh, the application, you know, what's, what's kind of needed in this situation. Of course, fuses outside of plugs and outside of PDUs don't really exist anymore. We don't really have fuses in, in fuse boards anymore. We have miniature circuit breakers inside um, uh, consumer units. And there's a very typical you know, C16 rated uh, mains uh, circuit breaker. And just remember that C16 rated, we'll get back to that a little bit because that's important for the kind of equipment that we use. And then in addition to uh, uh, an MCB, a miniature circuit breaker, uh, a kind of a mechanical replacement for a fuse, we also have uh, these things that you'll typically see one of just to the other side of the isolator in a fuse board, and that's a, a residual current device, an RCD. Uh, RCD is a slightly different kettle of fish. It's a two-pole two device, uh, so it's got live and neutral going through it. And essentially, by, by magnetic induction, it's looking for the difference in current going up the live line and coming back down the neutral line. And if they are significantly different, it breaks the circuit. Because if they are significantly different, where is that current going? It's probably going through somebody's body to earth. And so an RCD is, again, another safety feature that, that potentially saves your life because as soon as current starts conducting through your body, the RCD trips the circuit and, and you're good. Um, they're not the answer to everything. And although the 17th edition mandates RCDs wherever you can't show a good reason to not have one, uh, they are the very devil in, in production facilities because um, inductive loads, which we'll talk about in a bit, inductive loads uh, fool RCDs very easily. So the last thing you want is to turn on a, a rack of spinning disks 
and have the RCD trip out for no good reason other than it's an inductive load rather than a resistive load, which is what the RCD is kind of best optimised for. So here's a, here's a few uh, photos from, um, I was going to say a recent build, no, it's a build from ages ago, and this is the, uh, when, when we first moved the joint. Um, uh, but uh, these are the kind of typical things that, that are, are uh, unique to kind of server rooms, uh, MCRs, the kind of facilities you know, you know, we look after as broadcast engineers and, and production engineers. And uh, uh, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not a pretty installation, but it is a very safe installation. So there's, there's, there's well-earthed um, uh, metallic uh, cable tray everywhere for the, for, the earth's, for, for the main supplies. The last thing you want is, is mains feeders flapping around in the breeze. They should all be tied down. And then you can see the isolatable C16 connectors above where the, where the, where the bay is going to be, the commando outlets. Um, uh, an earth bus bar, common for all the bays, and also, in you know, best practice, common also to the edit suites and the, and the other production rooms where production equipment sits. And that all relates to the fact that all the equipment we, we use is what's termed class one equipment. So again, we'll, we'll get to class one equipment in a minute, but uh, these are the kind of things you'd expect to see um, in, a, in a probably, prob prob in a properly configured machine room, um, uh, we, uh, I, was, I was at a customer site uh, last week and, uh, and they really just wanted to, to, to power all their racks off the 13 amp sockets around the room, ignorant of the fact that all those sockets were on a ring main and not on individual spur circuits. Um, you know, somebody plugs in a hoover next door, takes out uh, an MCB and suddenly your whole MCR goes down. It's an awful thought. Um, another thing that's peculiar to our industry uh, that, that uh, uh, is useful to us is this idea of remotely controllable, remotely monitorable power distribution. So they're very typical kind of, um, were they a APC or Eton? No, um, uh, remotely controllable power strips that you might see down the back of a, of a comms rack, very kind of IT kind of thing. Um, we prefer the PDUs that take up one year at the top of the bay, um, uh, much easier to dress and, and do a nice job uh, for, for, for a, a, a broadcast install. So I'm going to show you, um, I thought I was, there we go. So this is, this is uh, a web page that's being served up by one of the PDUs in one of our racks at the Volta Data Center in Farringdon. And uh, this is, th th these ones are manufactured by Bryant. But, I mean, there's, there's lots available, but th these are the nicest ones we've found. And, and there's a whole load of stuff going on here. Uh, you can see all the outlets, which we've named, and, and kind of AGA Key Pro. That's clearly playing back some video for demo purposes, and a content agent, and a VPN server, and a Mellanox switch. Leave on. <laughs> Um, and some other stuff, uh, you know, a Blackmagic Video Hub and, and, and stuff being powered out of this particular mains distribution unit. Um, and, uh, you know, you can switch uh, circuits on and off. You can monitor the current draw and the apparent power draw as well, because this can take into account the power factor, can measure the power factor. And in fact, depending on which of these um, uh, uh, graph uh, tabs I select, I can see. So at the moment, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the current draw of the Mellanox. So the blue waveform is the voltage, just mains voltage, 50 hertz, uh, 250 volts RMS, so peaking at 300 and something volts. Uh, and you can see the green line is the current draw. And uh, you kind of think if that was just a resistive load, if that was a toaster or an electric fire, that current draw would, would track the mains perfectly. But it, it, it isn't. It's a, it's a switch mode power supply. And so consequently, it's... Uh, it, it's pulling current uh, based on uh, you know, the requirements of the, of the flyback transistor and the smoothing capacitors and all that kind of stuff. And so it doesn't quite track the voltage very, very perfectly. But I can, there's some other measurements we can look at. We can see uh, um, the power factor uh, for this particular piece of equipment, how, how efficient a, a load it is. You know, in, inductive loads uh, uh, look uh, different to, 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 to resistive loads. Um, if you remember... Um, you know, if you did physics at school or at university, CIVIL is a little acronym that tells you that in an inductive load, the voltage and the current are out of phase with each other a tiny amount. And, and, and the tiny amount is, once crunched through some efficiency calculations, we, we call the power factor. Um, but there's a whole lot of stuff we can tell here. I can, I can look at the... Um, I can look at the, uh, the, the, um, the PDU in its entirety and, and see uh, what kind of current draw we're, we're pulling. I can, I can look at um, things like earth leakage and, and lots of other things that are very important, um, uh, you know, which we might want to know about. And I can turn things on and off, which in the case of the main network switch for this installation might be a disaster, because once turned off, I can't get back in to turn it on. I mean, that would be just a you know, disaster if I turned that off. That really would be a half-hour bicycle trip out to Volta to turn that back on. 
The nice thing about these PDUs is as well as providing all this rich information about the, 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 the circuits, that, the, the equipment that's hanging off them, is that I can run um, macros on them. There's enough grunt in the FPGA on there, and I've written a macro such that these two circuits here, if I do turn them off, there's a macro that checks every five seconds to see if these ones are off, and if they are off, it'll turn them back on again. Now, I don't know what demos are going on upstairs or over at, uh, at um, Water Amuse at the moment, so I'm not going to turn it off just to demonstrate this, but, uh, but th th this is, uh, you know, we look at a lot of these things, and for us, this has been just a revelation of how good a remotely controlled PDU can be and how much rich information it can tell you. And so, for example, I know for a fact that I've got a, a linear power supply that's starting to misbehave itself. I think this Mac Mini here. So if we're going to look at that. So that's a very typical linear power supply. It's only drawing current for a small part of the cycle. You know, it's just a, it's just a dropper capacitor, isn't there, in, in the power supply there. And the very fact that there's a variable DC offset on there tells us that there's probably a big cap that's on its way out. Now, all these things a macro can read and raise an SNMP trap uh, to alert us that something's going, going pear-shaped. We had a, um, uh, the Venice, the, 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 the DVS um, multi-channel playback server, which isn't in there at the moment. Uh, it's, it's actually in the demo room up here for, for reasons I won't bore you with. But uh, that, that, uh, about a year ago, that had a power supply that died. And for several weeks beforehand, I kept looking in on it and, uh, and, and I could see that that power supply was on the way out and I just didn't have this, you know, because it's always got blinking four power supplies, so I didn't worry about it too much. But, but these kind of things can really allow you to do proper remote monitoring, remote um, proactive diagnosis of, of faults as they kind of come along. Now, the thing that's not hugely obvious if you're not kind of into electrical distribution and things like that is the fact that most premises bigger than a domestic premises, bigger than a very small office, have what's called a three-phase incoming. They have three phases of mains uh, supplied by the electrical company. And you, know, you look at that power distribution board there, and you can clearly see there's, there's red, blue, and yellow phases. And you can look at that isolated there. That's clearly isolating three feeds. And you know, what's that all about? Why, why do we have three phases of power? Well, it turns out that you know, uh, big spinning electromechanical machines that, that generate power, they do it more efficiently when you can tap off three coils around the rotating magnet or whatever the, the arrangement is, you can, you can turn more of that induced uh, uh, magnetic field into electrical current if you do it three phases around a, a, a circular rotating machine. And the same is true at the other end. Big motors, the things that pull lifts up and down lift shafts, uh, the things that drive large air conditioning condensers, they operate more efficiently if, they, if you do it with three phases, where the phases of the supply are offset by 120 degrees. And, and so that's, that's, that's what we mean when we talk about three-phase power. Now, um, there's, there's some question uh, as to how three-phase power is billed for. Um, uh, for the longest time, three-phase power was always billed three times the most used phase. That's not always the case now, particularly in buildings that have upgraded from a single phase to a three-phase supply. But it is still reasonably ubiquitous that um, uh, UK Power Networks or EDF or whoever you get your electricity for, if you have a three-phase supply, they are billing you three times your most used phase. And that makes sense because, you know, if you're generating power, uh, you have to spin, uh, you, you have to drive the mechanical load of the generator um, to satisfy the most used phase of the, of the coils on the output of the generator. And so this was a uh, facility I was at last year, and I noticed on their incoming they were pulling 14 amps on one phase, 48 amps on another phase, and nothing, nothing measurable on their third phase. So they were, in that case, paying um, for um, uh, 48 amps, uh, uh, you know, continuous use, uh, literally paying twice as much per kilowatt hour than they needed to because they hadn't gone to the, the trouble of balancing their phases. Um, there's a common sort of misconception that uh, within facilities that you have to have all your technical gear on the same phase. And that dates really from the 16th edition, where the 16th edition didn't allow for, for phase split, phases split across racks. And so it was literally just easier to hang the machine room off the red phase or off the yellow phase or whatever. Um, and there was a facility I worked at in the early 90s where um, uh, the studio lighting grid and the machine room were both hung off the red phase. And uh, the office plug sockets were hung off the blue phase. And I think lights were hung off the, the yellow phase. And we managed to half our electricity bill in a year by, by balancing that up and getting it right. Um, the, the reason why, uh, uh, you know, as recently as the early 90s, you weren't allowed to have phases in bays next to each other was this idea that if you could reach two phases, you can put more than 200 volts across yourself. And, and that's considerably more dangerous than a main shock. 
Um, but the 17th, in fact, I think it was the third revision of the 16th edition, recognised that with the introduction of RCDs and, and, and just the economy of all this, we, that, that wasn't tenable. Um, so, so that's no longer the case. So before we start talking about um, uh, mains hum and those kind of things, we have to talk about the difference between a class one and a class two piece of equipment. Pretty much all the broadcast equipment we use is a class one piece of equipment. Uh, but class two, or double insulated, you, you will have seen that, that symbol, that square inside a square symbol on the back of, uh, of, of generally things that have a plastic case, um, uh, indicates that it's a class two or double insulated electrical appliance. And what that means is that no single uh, failure can result by uh, a conductor, an electrical conductor, um, uh, touching uh, an exposed piece of metalwork. So the, the double insulation element means that there has to be at least two um, uh, insulating parts between the person who's using the equipment and, and, and dangerous voltages inside it. And one of those, one of those uh, insulating layers can be an air gap. And so that's why if you, if you crack open a, a cheap and cheerful CD player or whatever that has a mains power coming into it, it'll be a double insulated piece of equipment. And uh, the plastic of the case and the air gap between dangerous volts and you is, is the double insulation. But as mentioned, all the equipment we deal with, or pretty much all of it, you know, most of it, is class one equipment. It has a metal chassis. And so the equipment has to have an earth connected to the metal chassis because if a conductor on the inside were to come, up, come adrift and land on the chassis, you don't want a piece of equipment that's live that doesn't immediately blow the fuse. That's, that's, that's kind of obvious. Uh, but of course the problem there is that uh, you've got mains earth on the chassis and a bunch of BNCs on the back of the equipment, the back of the Sony Vision Mixer there, or, or anything that's got a metal back panel, uh, all the BNCs or whatever connector, the earth element of that connector, um, uh, you know, pin one on an XLR, or the body of an unbalanced audio connector, or BNCs, or whatever connector, uh, the earth element is now connected to mains earth. So signal earth and mains earth are essentially connected together. Now, consider that piece of equipment downstairs in the, in the machine room, and uh, a monitor up in the, in the vision stack in the studio, or, or you know, whatever other um, sort of configuration you want to think about. If the monitor in the studio is being powered off a main supply where there is even a tiny difference in the potential of, of, of the earth, uh, um, the protective earth, uh, and you connect a BNC cable from the vision mixer in, in the machine room via a CTP, up a tie line, via a wall box, whatever, via a jack fill, whatever, that earth has made its way up to the studio. And when you connect it to the back of the monitor, whose metal back panel is connected to local mains earth, if there is any potential difference between those two earths, that current has to flow somewhere. And where does it flow? Well, it down, flows down the shield of the cable. It has to. Uh, and, and, and there's an earth differential, and the piece of equipment at the other end now has to figure out not only this SDI signal that's coming in, I have to figure that out, but I've now got a big blinking 50 hertz hum on top of that signal. How, you know, what, what does that mean? In analog days, that would have presented itself as a hum bar. You'd see a hum bar running through the picture, because 50 hertz, 50 fields per second, very close to each other. It would be a very slow moving hum bar, very annoying. Um, in the case of audio equipment, analog audio equipment, it's, it's, a, it's a mains hum you know, imposed on the audio signal, burnt into the audio signal, if you will. In the case of digital um, uh, signals, uh, it's, it's corrupted pixels. It's corrupted, it's, it's clicks and splats on an AES feed. It's, it's pink and green flashes on, a, on an SDI feed. And so in the analog domain, it was very easily noticed. You'd turn on the monitor on day one of the new facility and you'd see a humbar and you'd know that you'd done something wrong with the mains. In a digital facility, you might get away with it for, for months and months until the weather warms up a bit and the, and the earth supply in the MCR and the earth supply that came in from the other side of the building drifts slightly apart from each other and suddenly you've got splats and clicks and everything else that you don't want. And so our standard sort of advice to people is that if you're building a, uh, a, 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 a production facility, make sure that the technical supply that goes up to the edit suite, that 16 amp commando outlet that sits in the edit suite that powers all the production equipment on the edit desk, has its earth derived from the same earth for all the equipment in the machine room. And, and, and there's a very sort of typical, nicely dressed uh, sort of earth system for a big facility. I think that's um, ITV uh, in, in the Orange Tower in Media City, um, but I can't remember, it's a, a job we were involved with. And, uh, and, and so all the earths come back to a, a good, solid, uh, common earth uh, bus bar, uh, which means that there's no potential for potential difference between the, 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 the panels on the backs of pieces of equipment that are in the MCR and pieces of equipment that are up in the edit suite. And 
As far as an, a, 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 an electrician is concerned, he'll install an electrical installation that's safe. Uh, but as, as broadcast engineers, our concern is an electrical installation that's not only safe, but it doesn't put blinking hum on all our signals. And so it's a slightly more elevated requirement. And it's why, as, as engineers, we have to be aware of this stuff. Um, there's, there's been quite a few installations where we've had no hand in the electrical design. And we, we, and we have a, a document that's kind of a set of recommendations. We say, please make your Sparky read this document. Uh, it'll, it'll serve you well. And they don't, or they just don't see the point of all this nonsense about unified earths, etc. And they wire up all the edit suites to an incoming mains feed that's the other side of the building that came in you know, from the same electrical company, but potentially even came from a different substation um, uh, uh, compared to the machine room that's down the other end of the building or in the basement or whatever. And, and there's, there's hum over everything. And once that happens, what can you do about it? You know, it's, it's expensive to fix. Um, OB engineers, kind of, they all kind of carry these things around with them, which are just sort of uh, humbucking um, transformers uh, where it lifts the earth, essentially. Um, so, uh, yeah, because obviously OBs are... Uh, they're the Wild West. They've, you know, they're, they're lucky if they get their own generator. And they may be powering things from many places. Um, obviously, fibre optic uh, cabling doesn't suffer from any of this because it doesn't carry an earth with it. Um, the thing that some customers have tried to kind of get away with is then tying their earths together, um, uh, which is never a great idea. The cooking earths, you know, which feed the domestic mains distribution throughout a facility, um, they derive from a different uh, earth bus bar than our production clean earth, our technical earth. Um, and where it has bitten people in the backside, they've sort of tried running a big bit of copper between the two earthing systems. And of course, then you start running into the point of, well, what is even the point of having a technical main supply? You know, vacuum cleaners, you know, cheap Chinese made phone chargers, all that kind of stuff being plugged onto the domestic supply. Any, any crap they push back onto the, onto the domestic power distribution then makes its way onto the production um, mains. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not great. Um, the reason why we tend to wire everything, um, uh, you know, power and edit desk supplies on commandos and all equipment on, on um, uh, IECs is that uh, no vacuum cleaner's got an IEC on the end of it, no phone charger's got a commando connector on the end of it, and it provides good segregation. It provides, you know, real um, uh, segregation between the domestic and, and the, and, and the, the uh, production uh, mains supply. Uh, once you've cross-coupled the Earths as well, trying to fault find it is, is the very devil because everything is, is zero impedance, it's, it's low, low impedance. Um, so uh, inductive loads, uh, mentioned that earlier when we saw the, 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 the graph, uh, you know, the live graph from the, from the PDU, uh, one of our, our racks at the Volta Data Centre. Um, inductive loads are, are, are results from equipment that's got lots of magnetic um, things inside, so spinning hard drives big switch mode power supplies, things that, are, uh, that, that rely on energy being stored momentarily in a magnetic field. Uh, and, and they will tend to have the voltage uh, leading the current rather than the voltage and the current draw being in, in phase with each other. And as a consequence, uh, the kind of MCBs that your electrician will put in your, your distribution board at home um, are often fooled by that. C-rated breakers, which you see everywhere, and they're fine for toasters and lights and, and, and things like that, are often fooled by very big inductive loads. And so we always recommend that people put D-rated breakers in their distribution boards. And again, it's not something that most electricians ever think about. They just want to produce a safe installation, whereas we want them to produce a media-friendly installation, if you will. And, uh, you know, they'll often stop... Uh, you know, a D-rated breaker isn't fooled by that big rack of hard drives all spinning up at the same time, uh, whereas a C-rated breaker may well be. The other thing we, we often have to um, uh, uh, work to is, is provide the customer with um, both power and cooling figures for the mains um, in, in, in a machine room that we're designing. And the thing we've found out consistently, and Avid are the worst offenders, is um, the amount of current that equipment pulls. Avid essentially will specify everything as being twice what it really is. So there's a photograph from our workshop with a uh, clamp meter um, measuring the, uh, the incoming on a, a, an ISIS 2500. Um, and I think uh, the specification that Avid says that that should pull about two and a half amps. It's actually pulling 1.3 amps. Um, uh, and so if you, if you built your machinery based on, on everything that the manufacturers said, uh, you know, even taking into effect the, the you know, power factors at the worst possible kind of 0.8, um, you'd be over-specifying hideously. And of course, for every um, uh, kilowatt hour of electricity you burn, you produce a kilowatt of, of, of continuous heat. Um, 
you know, all the equipment we use is essentially just room heaters. You think about any piece of equipment, a media composer or, or, or anything, you know, some sort of encoding box or whatever, they all essentially take electricity and turn it into heat. That's what they do. Not more than 99% of the electrical power that's consumed by all the equipment in your machine rooms is coming back out as heat. So, of course, you, know, you burn a kilowatt of, of, of power, you have to cool that kilowatt back down again. Otherwise, you know, within a few minutes, your machine room catches fire. And so, typically, you know, at the design stage, we're figuring out um, uh, you know, the current draw, or, or rather the number of kilowatts that each piece of equipment's pulling, and, and we're, we're totaling it up and presenting it to the client. And this, this idea that 99% of, of, of all electrical power uh, is, is then kicked out the back of the equipment as heat, it's kind of quite offensive to some people. They can't believe it. I've spent all this money on a piece of equipment and it's just heating my room up. But are you sure? Are you sure it's not doing anything useful? No, it's not, you know? The uh, third law of thermodynamics can't be violated, you know? You're burning electricity, it winds up as heat. Um, and so we tend to tell the aircon guy what he wants to know, how many BTUs of heat all this stuff's gonna kick out. Tell the electrician what he wants to know, how many kilowatts of power it's all gonna pull because people often don't believe that that's the case. So what documentation would you, should you expect from, from your systems integrator? What, 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 what should you expect um, uh, you know, for your installation? Um, well, on a per circuit basis, uh, run current, which may only be you know, achievable once it's all installed, but even before you started to install equipment, you want to know that um, there's nothing in this wonderful install that is, is, is pulling current that, that, that you're paying for. Uh, run leakage, uh, the difference between the current traveling down the live conductor compared to coming back up the neutral conductor uh, that difference should never exceed 3.5 milliamps. That's, that's been the standard for a long time. And it's the case that uh, if you had a, a whole rack of stuff where everything was exceeding a 3.5 milliamps, uh, you'd, uh, you'd definitely run into problems with RCDs. Um, and we try and avoid putting RCDs into, into machine rooms, but they may well be upstream, big ones, upstream of this on the incoming feed. Um, and in fact, what we've discovered is that some of the cheaper PDUs that even big name SIs will sell, some of the ones that are made in Shenzhen province, um, uh, you know, unknown brands from China, um, even the PDU will have more than three and a half milliamps of leakage within the PDU before you've hung any equipment off it. So that's kind of something that needs to be paid attention to. So they're the things you'd expect to see on a per circuit basis. And on a per bay basis, you'd expect to see earth continuity, uh, that a very, very low impedance of, of the earth path um, you know, back to ground. And we typically go for the kind of belt braces and another belt um, kind of arrangement of, of taking the incoming earth um, from, the, from the 16 amp feed into the bay, attaching that to the metalwork of the bay, and then bringing in several earths from the main bus bar and attaching those at the ends of the racks, and then making sure all the racks are bonded together. So there's always three paths back to earth, uh, so the earth continuity is, is exactly as it should be. An insulation test. Uh, the impedance between uh, the earth path and the current carrying conductor should never be below one uh, mega ohms. And that's achieved by, in a tester, by shorting live and neutral together and, and, and measuring that. And then we do a flash test. Um, again, the tester um, it generates 1.5 kilovolts, passes that down the earth and makes sure that none of it flashes over to the current carrying conductors. And what that tests for is, just imagine if all you could do was use a voltmeter to test your earth path, um, and your earth at some point in the chain is hung on by just a single whisker of copper. You know, a cable has almost come all the way off and there's just a single whisker of copper hanging on. The flash, te flash test will burn out that piece of copper and, and fail the, 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 the bay. And so it kind of tells you that although your earth at very low voltages was safe, uh, when we flash it with 1.5 kilovolts, um, uh, it, it didn't hold up. Um, when, uh, when, I, when I worked at uh, the BBC, uh, I used to work on a late night art show called The Late Show that came out of Lime Grove Studios. And every band that came in had to have their equipment uh, tested in the workshop. And so you probably don't remember them, but there was a, uh, there was a, there was a, a band out of uh, San Francisco in the um, late 80s called Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians. And they came into Lime Grove to appear on The Late Show. And the keyboard player dutifully brought his DX7 into the workshop to test. And I flash tested it twice and it just killed the DX7. <laughs> and so we had to go out and hire him one quickly. Uh, so the point is that for computer equipment, don't do the flash test that often if you're pat testing a piece of equipment on the bench. And 
And so if you've come to, to, to Route 6, Jigsaw 24 Route 6, and you've had us build your installation, this is the, this is the test sheet you'll get back from us, showing on a per circuit basis and on a per bay basis, all those things. Um, so you can be certain that somebody paid attention and your installation is safe. And of course, all those records should be kept with your other safety related records, your method statement, your COSH details, all those kind of things. So the legal requirements for media facilities are the Health and Safety at Work Act, uh, 74 and 92, uh, and the Ele Electricity at Work Regulations, um, 1989. The Reporting of Injuries, Diseases and Dangerous Occurrences Regulation, that's your, yeah, that's your accident report book. And although the 17th edition, revision 3, which is currently in force, and what's coming up, the 18th edition, aren't legal requirements, they are very heavily mentioned in, in those other bits of legislation. And it would be the very devil to prove to Malud that you'd taken things seriously if um, somebody got killed on your watch and you didn't have, and you weren't up to date with, with what the 17th edition claimed of you. Now, that, that piece of text there. Um, the chief danger of every new application of electricity arises mainly from ignorance and inexperience on the part of those who supply and fit up the requisite plant. The difficulties that beset the electrical engineer are chiefly internal and invisible, and they can only be effectually guarded against by testing or probing with electric currents. That sounds, sounds very legalese, doesn't it? And you think, oh, that, that must be from a, a contemporary piece of legislation. It's not. It's from the first edition of the, uh, of the regulations that came out in Victorian times in 1882. And they stretched to four pages. There you go. If you were, uh, if you were doing our job back in, uh, back in Victorian times, that's all you had to worry about, four pages. And half of that is kind of uh, rubric. Um, but of course, nowadays, 17th edition from 10 years ago, and although I've got a picture of the red book there, it's actually a gold book now because we're in the third revision of that. And, and what did the 17th edition uh, bring to us? Well, it brought a greater emphasis on the use of RCDs. Um, 30 milliamps of leakage current uh, mandated, unless a good reason can be shown. And a good reason is, I don't want my machine room to, to fall over, and it's a machine room, and engineers and operators go in there, competent people go in there. And that's, that is a good justifiable reason. The problem of harmonics... If you've ever hung your oscilloscope across the mains, you'll know that in Soho, the mains isn't a nice smooth sine wave. It's tending towards being a square wave. And that's because of, of the fact that every piece of equipment uses a switch mode power supply or a resonant mode power supply, and it's feeding harmonics back up onto the line. <coughs> and and uh, you know, that can cause problems where equipment expects a sine wave. Um, uh, uh, new special locations were defined by the 17th edition, including TV outside broadcast trucks. Um, and, and so if you work for an outside broadcast provider, um, uh, you know, there's an expectation that a member of your staff is an NIC recognised inspector. Um, phase sequences. Until the 17th edition, the regs had nothing to say about, about the order of phases, whether the red phase hits, hit, hits peak first or, or whatever. Uh, but now that is well defined in the regs and it means that you don't ever run into that problem of of air conditioners running in the wrong direction or just sitting there with a the motor oscillating because you've got the phases wired in the wrong order. Uh, the 17th edition also uh, uh, defines a skilled person and an instructed person. Um, uh, and uh, you know, the, w w the, when I last did the training, uh, the thing that the guy from the health and safety executive, the, the one phrase that really hit home to everybody was that a corpse changes everything. Uh, you, you know, if, if, if somebody dies because of something you did wrong electrically and you can't show that you took every step to mitigate for that, kind of you're in trouble. It behooves all of us um, to make sure that we are trained, that we are that competent person, an instructed person, as the regs say. Um, it just kind of reiterates all that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and typically, uh, where you work, instructed persons are engineers, skilled persons are everybody else. Now, this is interesting. This is, a, this is um, taken from the 17th edition. And it says, one of the fundamental principles of the 17th edition is that uh, no addition or alteration, temporary or permanent, should be made to an existing installation unless the rating condition of any existing equipment, um, uh, including that distributor, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, so so, so the, the upshot of this is that although existing installations weren't expected to be modified, to be brought up to the standard of the 17th edition, any new installations or any even moderately altered installations do have to comply with the 17th edition. Um, now, the very important part of that is that uh, there's an unintended consequence going on here. Ten years ago, um, uh, in the last ten years, we have had an average year-on-year -year increase of 29% in electrical fires in this country. And the reason for this is that about ten years ago, electricians were starting to be much more subcontracted. They were starting to buy cheap uh, Chinese import parts on eBay because they were providing parts rather than 
the, the, the main contractor providing parts. And so, and, 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 and this additional misunderstanding of the 17th edition that people now assume that any additional work involves bringing the whole installation up to the, the level of the 17th edition. And so we've got this situation where this perfect storm of electricians not being entirely aware of what the 17th edition really implies, cheap Chinese parts being available on eBay that don't really hit the specifications. Just because it's got a CE mark stamped on it, that doesn't mean anything. Um, and that's why the third, the, the, the third revision of the 17th edition last year reintroduced the requirement for metallic consumer units. The 17th edition you know, initial uh, thing from 10 years ago did not require metallic consumer units, but they are now required. And this is in an effort to head off this unintended consequence of, of, of the 17th edition. So the 18th edition is nearly upon us, uh, and, uh, and so uh, just a, a little overview of what the changes are. Um, uh, they seem to become a lot more aware of this idea of protection against overvoltage. Um, uh, it is the case that, that um, uh, main supply in this country very, very rarely goes over voltage. Uh, you know, if you've bought one of those, you know, surge suppressing main strips that they sell in Ryman's and places like that, you know, that thing will never have to do any work because, you know, w w we have fantastic main supply in this country and it never really goes over anything. But in big industrial installations where um, voltages may, may be being stepped up and down for use in machinery via AVRs and things like that, up until now the regulations have not had a lot to say about over voltage and that's, that's all part of the 18th edition now. Uh, protection against fires. Um, uh, so RCDs obviously brought a lot of um, uh, uh, good stuff uh, because you know they protect against earth faults. But for arcing and um, uh, and, and, and things like that between parallel live conductors, um, the, an RCD doesn't detect that. And so uh, um, sort of separation of, of of current carrying conductors is now uh, sort of wrapped into the 18th edition. And a new section is energy efficiency. Uh, there's now uh, a, uh, an implication in the 18th edition, and I've not seen the full thing yet. We've got our books on order. Me and the guys are, are booked to go on the training. Um, but we've yet to see what that really means. Uh, but the, the feeling is that there'll be some sort of um, requirement on, on um, big users of electricity to show that, that, that um, energy efficiency is being taken seriously. So there you go, further reading. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the third revision of the 17th. Um, you know, really should be on your bookshelf if, if you're a facilities engineer. And we bang on about this stuff endlessly on, on the Route 6 blog and on my blog as well. In fact, that's the, all the initial information about the 18th edition, uh, which is online. Um, it's administered by the IET, which is a, a fine uh, engineering institution, uh, which I urge you to join. Now, just before we go, I thought I'd show you some horror show pictures. Um, and these are all photographs I've taken at TV facilities in the last five years. Uh, so obviously that one at the end there is, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, no, 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 no guessing for what's wrong there. Uh, that one there, I mean, there's two things. Not only have they not wired in the, uh, the incoming twin and earth correctly, uh, but you know, they're taking a feed out of the socket without a mains cable. And that was in a real working facility. This one here is a bit more interesting. Um, what you're seeing here is the side of a barge. And what you're seeing here is the, is the murky water of the Camden Canal. And this is a customer we had, we, or we have, who has four edit suites on barges, uh, two in each barge. And it's, it's docked next to a little uh, jetty where their, where their production offices are. That's quite cute, quite, you know, people like that. But this 16 amp feeder, which comes off one of those little posts, like you see in kind of caravan sites and stuff, uh, feeding this barge, goes down under the, under the uh, boat and comes up in the bilges, where they've got a couple of cabinets with, uh, it was an avid ISIS at the time, and some other bits and bobs, and then edit suites in the boat. And over several months, they just had numerous bits of equipment just fail, just die, and they couldn't figure out why. And so they said, well, can you go and have a look, Phil? Let's go and see if we're kind of, you know, pet cemetery effect or something like that. You know, what's going on here? It's like seemingly unrelated equipment just dying on a regular basis. And so when I got there, um, the site manager showed me around, and I thought, well, I wonder if it's an earth leakage problem. I wonder if there's just excessive earth leakage that isn't being um, detected by an RCD. So I took the clamp meter, um, got into the, the intake in one of the barges, put the clamp meter on, and there was 100 milliamps of earth leakage. And you think, how on earth is anything even working under these situations? You know, and you put your voltmeter on the on the back of, of each of the Z840s that are running Avid, uh, you know, down to, to earth, and there's just a massive voltage on there. And it turned out that this 16 amp feeder going into each boat had been sitting in the water of the Camden Canal since 1979. 
And when I, when I leant down into the water to, to lift this cable up to inspect it, I just felt the rubber sort of like falling apart in my hands. And when I saw the glint of copper, I thought, no, that's going back in there. I'm not touching that. And, and so what had happened was this waterlogged cable, which, you know, rubber starts off as being very water resistant, but after decades, the water in, it gets into the rubber. And, and so there was so much earth leakage being induced in the cable that all the equipment uh, essentially had a very, a very lively earth, if you will, and there was no means of detecting that because you know the, the, the incoming feed is that is in that state. And when I looked at the the little um, uh, commando outlet on the on on the pole by where the boat was parked, the little RCD that was in there, this little piece of wood had been jammed in there to hold it on. So clearly this had been a problem for a while, you know. Um, and so as soon as they replaced that and these feeders, the problem went away. Um, so, you know, the problems of sort of electricity in kind of weird situations, particularly when water is involved, are, are, are many and numerous. But that's it. That's all I've got for you. Um, uh, there's uh, croissants and coffee. You're welcome to stay. Um, or if there's any questions, now's a good time for those as well.